Tonight we're doing the fifth lecture of six theological bubble about Shabbat Shalom, and it's a little bit like a like a uh, you know adventure series. When last we left off, <laughs> our hero or our villain was in certain circumstance, but I can't help but such a dramatic and weird story, and I keep prefacing because I have to that the sources are so in conflict over here. And all the sources lie so much and, and omit and, and, and make up that I find it at least very hard to pick through the uh, minefield of historical uh, records and tr try the best we can to ascertain what exactly happened. But we last left off in Hanukkah of 1665. I'll say again, in Hanukkah of 1665, when Shabtai Tzi was doing strange things in a shul in Izmir. We talked last week. He converted to Islam in Elul of 1666. He converted so, to what? Islam. Islam. Yeah, hold on. Oh, I see. Yeah. Wow, boy, that's good. Yeah, no. Uh, to, wait a minute, but I just want to give a framework. So it's Hanukkah to the middle of Elul. So that's not a year, right? The whole bubble is from Hanukkah of 1665 to 15 Elul, two weeks for Rosh Hashanah, 16. So keep, keep that in mind. At least I find that useful. Um, chronologically. There are your dates. Okay? Now, uh, so it's a highly dramatic episode because it happens in such a telescoped period of time. He was at that time in Smyrna or Izmir, which is a major Turkish port. Here's Turkey over here, Izmir. Uh, here's the capital city where the Sultan lives, Istanbul. So it's, uh, as it's on the Aegean Sea. The reason I'm mentioning is because in its heyday, in the 17th century, was its heyday. It was a major port. It's all kind of foreigners. Every group that does business, Spanish merchants, Italian merchants, English, French, Russian even, and things like this are all over the place. And that gives these port cities a kind of a, a uniquely cosmopolitan character. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, if anything unusual happens, it gets instant dissemination throughout the world because these business people are constantly sending reports and letters back to their companies and their employers and things of this nature. And so the hawk is major. And anything Shabtai does, and the Jews say, oh, this week he did, you know, he ate trafer, something like that. Immediately you find these, historians find these, in the documents of English companies, of French consuls, of you know, Dutch uh, journalists, and so forth. It's, it, it's, and Germans, it's, it's remarkable. The, um, Ma'aminim, as they're called by now, the believers, as they call themselves, the Ma'aminim. Because after all, don't you say, Ani Ma'amin Behemunah Shalem Bavis Hamashiach? What's wrong with you? They're growing by leaps and bounds. Shabtai is promising the world. He's even promising women to get rid of the curse of Eve. Wouldn't be bad? Okay? No pain in childbirth. A week after Hanukkah, a week after Hanukkah is what? Is a Sarbatev. He abolishes a Sarbatevis. So here we have a famous scene. Here's Shabtai the Rebbe. They're, they're, look how they're lined up to get a bracha. I'll tell you again, the Hasidic movement, which came in the next century, has nothing to do with Sabbatianism, but people say, I guess, it's a lot of the same business. <laughs> you understand? Um, and so uh, it's just growing hugely. On December 30th, I'm trying to keep a, a, you to a chronological framework. So it starts on Hanukkah and will end just before Rosh Hashanah. So on December 30, 1665, last day of the year, uh, next to the last day of the year, Shabtai sails for Istanbul. So in those days, it's, it's actually easier to go this way, they thought, than this way, than up, up through land. And especially if Smyrna is a city. However, it's not so posh, as we'll see later on, because the Aegean Sea is a war zone. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but during the entire 1660s, which is the time of Shabtai Sea, major war, Eastern Mediterranean, specifically in the Aegean Sea, Republic of Venice versus the Ottoman Empire. Right? Again, it like boggles the mind to think that a little country like Venice did, but they did. Okay, and you had major battles, and sometimes this side won, and sometimes that side won. And so it's not simple. I might point out, by the way, that piracy was uh, very heavy in those days, I've mentioned before, and every Jewish community, including Izmir, had a pity in civilian committee, especially the Sephardim, they call the Sociedad de los Cotivos, the Society of Captives, and uh, their job is the pity in you know what I mean? Because, because uh, commerce and travel is, is, is a tricky business in those days. Anyhow, in December 30th, he sails for Istanbul. Responsible Jewish leaders, responsible Jewish leaders, are scared 
about the Ottoman Turkish government. After all, if a guy says he's the Jewish Messiah, one of the implications is he's going to overthrow the Ottoman Empire. It should be a few days' journey, but it's greatly delayed by storms. It takes a long time. And so the Aegean is what it is. But of course, the believers see that what's the meaning that Shabtai is going to the final one yard line and he's about to get a touchdown, and all of a sudden storms pop up. What is this? This is the devil trying to block the messianic triumph, the Sitra Achra, the forces of evil. So it only confirms the messianic nature of his journey yes. by sea. <laughs> Responsible leaders again are scared to death that the Sultan's government will go crazy and they warn the government. No, they don't tell the Turkish government that it's a Mishigas, it's not a rebellion. Okay. Uh, as a result, the government does not kill the Jews, which is considered a big miracle later on in the Jewish sources that I'll talk about later on. Yeah, he's the Prime Minister, Green. he's an important person in this whole um, episode. Prime Minister of Turkey. At that time, the Sultan is one of these people that's, that's uh, famous, actually, for giving all the power into the hands of the Grand Vizier, as they call them. And uh, he's the one that's going to be uh, running the show. And they tell him, they said, this guy's dangerous, but he's a nut. Don't blame the rest of the Jews. I, the Jews are swept up in this. It's a demagogue. Now, if you know the Turks, I'll show you some pictures later on, they could easily have reacted differently. So it's quite remarkable that they took a very moderate uh, and very uh, sensible uh, approach to this entire subject. Now, uh, the ship, since he was warned that a dangerous guy or a troublemaker is on his way to Istanbul, so Shabzai's ship is intercepted by the Turks um, on Shabbos, February 6, 1666, in the Sea of Marmara. Here, the, your knowledge of Turkish geography, which is extensive after I'm finished, yeah. will, is, is, is going to be only enhanced. Uh, here's the capital of Turkey. No, it's actually quite remarkable, the geography here. This is the famous or notorious Gallipoli Peninsula, where Churchill in the First World War thought to land the British Army over here and to march to Istanbul. But of course, the Turks formed a line here and uh, wiped them out almost, okay, and forced the British to retreat. So Gallipoli is part of all this. It's right next to the territory of the Marmor. The straits where Gallipoli is, where I'm pointing them, is called the Dardanelles, which You've heard it one time or another. So here's Shabtai with his ship after all the storms coming. And when he comes through here, he's intercepted by the Turkish police, Turkish Navy. Okay. And uh, two days later, on Monday, February 8th, 1666, the ship goes to, lands in Istanbul, in Constantinople, the capital city. There are Jewish crowds that are waiting, because after all, Mashiach is there. The Jewish crowds are waiting to uh, greet the boat. Dun, 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 dun. No, not really, because the Turkish police show up and you have Turkish crowd control, okay? In which case, well, this is a woodcut from the 1500s, all right? And uh, they, they, let, let, let me put it to you this way. Ain't no Freddie Gray problems <laughs> in the Ottoman Empire, <laughs> okay? There's, there's no lawsuits over there, you understand? Matter of fact, there aren't too many riots either. This is the reason. <laughs> now. Um, and so the Jews are beaten up and chopped up and so forth, so the, so, so the crowds disperse. But they interpret it simply as the last dying grasp of the Sitra Akra to try to prevent the Mashiach from attaining his goal and that they have a Muna Shalema that he will get, like in the uh, computer game, to the king in the palace, you know, where he needs to be. Two days, so that's what happened so forth. Two days after that, on Wednesday, February 10th, it's quite a week. Shabbos, the ship is intercepted. Two days later, it lands in Constantinople. Two days later, Shabtai is taken out of jail and hauled before the divan, which is the cabinet of the Ottoman Empire, and presided over the Grand Vizier, as I showed you before, Ahmed Koprulu, a very famous uh, person, very energetic and powerful Grand Vizier. Surprisingly, he didn't behead Shabtai then and there, because usually that's how they solve issues in Turkey all the time. If you're an unbeliever, they chop your head off. If you're a believer, you have the zuchos to be strangled with a silken cord. He ordered him instead imprisoned. So he really was a uh, pretty moderate on this issue. Shabtai's followers, and this is very Hasidic what I'm about to say, as soon as he finds out he's in jail, they raise a ton of money to get him from a bad cell to deluxe deluxe. Okay? They raise a lot of money, they bribe the jailers. After all, this is Turkey. 
and uh, they get chopped out of the presidential suite at the, at the prison. Uh, here he received visitors with great dignity, which only added to his reputation. So for the next several months, he will be in a Turkish prison in Istanbul. Look, there he is, you know, sort of locked up there at times. I don't even think this is accurate. Okay, this is, this is a uh, uh, artist uh, from the 1600s, an artist's reimagination. Actually, he lived much better than all this, but look at these guys bowing down and greeting him in delegations. It's, I keep coming back to the same thing that this foreshadows, uh, you know, what you see later in the Hasidic practice, the mass uh, going to get a bracha from the, uh, the, from the big person. Uh, now, when Nathan of Gaza, back in Israel, and his followers hear of this, they simply integrate all this into the Messianic saga, which means, as I said before, he was intercepted by the forces of evil trying to bring him to do it. Notice the Turks did not kill him. They're afraid to touch him. You, you can, you can, you can um, what's the right word, spin it any way you want, you see? Um, he's in jail, but he's living the life of Riley. You know, he lived better than you and I. And he, the Mashiach being in jail in the next to last mi minute sort of parallels the biblical prophecies about X, Y, and Z. And if it's not in the Bible, it's in the Talmud. If it's not in the Talmud, it's in the Zohar. If it's not in the Zohar, it should be in the Zohar. Now, <laughs> within, within weeks, so again, this all happened in February. So within weeks, it goes through March and April. Uh, Ahmed Kaprulu departs Istanbul to take command in the Cretan War, which had reached a, a crisis stage. So here's the famous uh, uh, battle zone, and here's the island of Crete. So just to give you an idea, here's uh, Istanbul, here's uh, the jail, here's Izmir, and here's Crete. So it's not far, far away. And Crete was held by um, the Venetians, and there were massive uh, sieges and counter sieges all during this time, to, people have no idea this thing existed, but you know, a lot of blood was shed on both sides. And, uh, you know, uh, the Venetians were winning, but now the Grand Vizier and the Sultan take the field with a new fresh army. And the point, as affects our story, is that all the people we'll see who are going to um, be considered political prisoners, VIP prisoners, or be transferred to a high security jail, as we would say today. Okay? Uh, for a political prison. And that's what happens with Shabtai, with the other VIP prisoners. So he goes back to Gallipoli. If you remember what I showed you uh, before. He was intercepted here, put in jail here, and now he's sent to a VIP prison over here. Okay? And uh, it's like the Joseph story. In fact, you can be darn sure I wasn't there, but I'm sure they're learning Parshas, uh, you know, Yosef. Makom Asher Asiri Hamel Hasurim. What do we know about Joseph? He found favor in the eyes of the Tsar Beis HaSoar, the eyes of the jailer. Oh, you dummy. You think the eyes of the jailer mentioned in the Bible refers to some Egyptian official? Oh, you fool. You don't know how to read the Bible. The Tsar Beis HaSoar, right? The angel in charge of imprisoning mankind. I could do it too if I had to. Anyway, so um, um, since it's Erev Pesach, and that makes it even better, he's put in the jail on Erev Pesach. So, I mean, when you're Jewish and you're in Salonika, Salonika or Izmir or Istanbul or the news travels throughout the Middle East or to Italy, which is not that far away, or a place like that, and you hear the Mashiach hasn't been imprisoned by the Turks, he's not being killed, he's transferred to VIP prison on Erev Pesach, um, basically, you start to tremble. And, uh, and Shabtai, being himself, uh, is in one of his manic modes and, uh, because, he, you know, he's constantly fluctuating as we saw, and so when he gets to jail, he does a carbon Pesach. Uh -huh. All right, hey, Shech's a, a lamb in the jail because they have enough money to buy everything. No, I'm not finished. He eats it with the chela, with the morin, right? Because he says the old rules in which there are parts of the lamb, you understand, parts of the lamb are kosher and parts of the lamb are not kosher. And anybody's familiar at all with the Mishnah or something like that will know that parts they offer up on the uh, altar burn, the part you eat, but you don't need the blood, for example, you don't need the, certain, the fats and whatever, but he does, <laughs> okay? And this is what he directs, because he said, I guess, we're now in a radical new reality. Uh -huh. You pedestrian, small-minded pygmies, that you're still following the old halachas, which reflected the pre-Messianic reality. Don't you understand where you're holding? It's, it's, it's the one inch line. We're about to get the touchdown. We're, we're, we're an inch away. And the Jews in Istanbul, who are not far away from this, right? 
So the news travels very fast. They go wild, as you might imagine, because after all, this is obviously based, as they're convinced, on deep sodos, and everybody here, I'm sure, knows. What do we know about Pesach? Zman matan Torah, Zman cheruzenu. And then, benitsa nigalu, benitsa nasin ligal. Why have you all heard that? When is the Mashiach coming? Pesach time. The world was creating Nisan, it's going to have Nisan. What does it say over there? Kimi tseischa meir tzitzrayim, and the flows. When the Mashiach comes, you're going to see wonders to remind you, right, of what happened time and time. This is it, baby. We didn't envision that it was going to involve a PIP and a jail and a Gallipoli, but hey, you know. Um, Shabtai remains there again for months. And once again, the money machine kicks in. The jailers are bribed to give them comfort and to allow daily pilgrimages by hundreds every day. So it becomes a thing where see them, so to speak, maybe I shouldn't use that word, no, but, no. You, but you, know what, you know what I'm saying, right? You know, but be a, a flock there um, by the hundreds all the time, they come to get a bracha, as I showed you before, and to give them pidionis, give them money. Right? They, notice, when they come, they're rich, they're poor, this and that, everybody gives them something, uh, which is a Kabbalistic concept, and uh, you don't see it over here, but these guys are all bringing gifts, and the result is that he and his entourage amass a lot of money, um, everybody's happy, the jailers make a fortune, the Turks think this is the greatest thing, you know, <laughs> that ever happened, um, and you end up, by the way, with that funny Gullus mentality of what you call the Shabbos Goy, which means who's, who's in Gullus and who's not in Gullus, you know, the, the Jews paying him top dollar, but he's, he's, he's doing what the guy tells him to do, so who, who's in charge over here? Anyway, um, but it's a very unusual jail, as the Sabatians refer to it, it's Migdal O's, Tower of Strength, because he was locked up in a tower. Um, by the time he's finished, reporters come, I mean, reports we get, Shabtai sets up a throne room. The room was carpeted and tapestried, scarlet and gold. He sits like a king on the throne. He wears scarlet robes. He has a small Torah scroll on a stand next to the throne. The Sefer Torah has a mantle of scarlet and solid, uh, 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 and, um, of scarlet mantle, and the Rimonim, you know I'm talking about, the Sephardic, they have the things they put on the top, the Rimonim, solid gold. You walk in there, whoo, now he was, you got to hand it to him, this, this, this is a certain type of, what should I say, you know, uh, make an impression, because, yeah, showmanship is good. No, the reason, I'll tell you why. He himself is sitting in the middle of luxury, very humble. It's a good shtick. You understand? People come in, he says, How do you do? He wouldn't say, You know, kiss my feet. Uh, how can I help you? Uh, very nice. So you have this contrast between the scene and the man. And everybody walks away from there saying, I guess, Ask the man, right? I mean, he told me he would solve my Shadduchim problem, my money problem, my this problem, my that problems. You know, pretty soon, Kali's will be ready. I mean, this is the person. And you know something? He shook my hands just like this. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't uh, you know, have any airs or things of this nature. It's a very charming. Jews flock there from all over the world to this Turkish prison. So basically, what you have during the months of April, May, June, July, whatever, is a surreal kind of scene. Uh, the movie has not been made of this yet, <laughs> okay? It's a surreal scene that the guy's in jail, he's a state prisoner, all the rest of it, but he's also proving Tish, and he's acting as if he's ruling the world. And the people coming in are engaging in what, who is it, Coleridge or one said, a willing suspension of disbelief. But that's how life is. Um, not only from all over the world, Dashkenazim is very famous. During this period, the, f the most famous rabbi in Poland, the Taz, right, the famous commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, very uh, leading halachic person who's very old. He sends his son, and I think the son-in-law, to visit Shabtai Tzvi to see if he's the real thing. He's not really what the Taz look like, but it might have been. Anyway, the, uh, the, the uh, but you know, he looks something like that. The, the point is, let's put it this way, he had a hat and a beard. Now, the, and, and he didn't have a black hat, he had the, uh, you know, sp uh, spotting. Now, well, it's not a strangle exactly, but we won't go into that. Anyway, the point is, that uh, here envoys from, from uh, Poland, as far away, they crossed the Black Sea to go see him. He has a very good, um, how should I say, 
I don't want to say an intelligence system, because with the Jews, you don't need intelligence. Everybody has such a big mouth of yaks. You just find out from you know, having a scene. You don't need the, you know, the old Joe Bushes and Borough Park and all that. So, I mean, that's really what, what's happening over there. Uh, so he's ready when they come, and he says, you're the son, you're the son-in-law, and how's the Todd's feeling? And they say he's got eye trouble and this trouble, and, and Shabtai gives him a saff. So this will cure this, and another thing will cure that. He's very, he's very uh, solicitous, and he tells them, I know you're from a Chasha background, so when I take over, you know, you'll be the king of the moon, you'll be the queen of the sun, you know, you, you get to be Mars and Jupiter, and things like that, you know, whatever, you, you, you rule, you'll be the, you, would you like to be the emperor of China? You know, the, the, uh, the, 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 this is how he gives it out. And they're not 100% uh, sold on it, but they're by no means unimpressed. And let's put it this way, could be, and that's already Madrega. Here are two big scholars in Poland. They're going to get back sort of like an official report, and they're probably going to say like this: He's not a monster. He doesn't have twelve heads. He doesn't have horns. He's clearly not a charlatan because even though he's living in a lap of luxury, he's, he's not doing it in this, what shall I say, televangelist kind of way or something. And uh, very modest. Clearly knows his, um, you know, his Gemara. He could talk to him. He did talk to him in learning. He knows his uh, Zohar and things like that. So it's not a total fake over here. And so, he may, you know, basically he kind of won him over. Despite his imprisonment, perhaps because of it, the movement grows and grows. Even the Turks start hedging their bets and acting nice to the Jews on the street. Because, uh, well, some do and some don't. But many do because, you know how it is, if these guys are so confident and the consequences of it being wrong are so severe, there must be something to it. And that only encourages the Jews who live in a Muslim country in which the Jews treat like dirt, dirt, dirt. The Jews in the Ottoman Empire officially were allowed to practice religion, and they were, but on a day-to-day -day basis, were always treated, um, what should I say, lower than low. I think I mentioned before, but I'll mention again, in Turkey, in, in this century, um, usually, if a Jew wanted to convert to uh, Islam, usually they wouldn't let him. You're too low class, you're a Jew. Here's what you should do. Go convert to Christian and then come and convert to us. Because then it'll be more chash of a Christian. You know, it's very low. Uh, the Turks are a race of warriors, and they were. The Jews had renounced uh, the sword and warfare. That made them look uh, uh, you know, extremely contemptible. And so uh, you don't get any respect. You may get certain privileges. And now all of a sudden, the Jews are acting different. And uh, the Turks are starting to give them respect. This is a heady experience. The Pope in Rome launches an investigation. Pope Alexander, right? Pope Alexander sends a, a commission to Palestine to find out who is this guy, Shout out to and uh, you know, like you say, it's an FBI investigation or something like that. Um, the summer of 1666, which is what I'm talking about, May, June, July, August, those months, sees the Sabatian movement explode in such a way across the Jewish world that it uh, nukes the opposition, basically. It sweeps them. Even the person who was the most sworn opponent of Shabtai Tzvi, and this is who he was. It was a Sephardic uh, rabbi, um, Sasportis, uh, a distinguished Talmud Chacham, I might say. And because he was a distinguished Talmud Chacham, he had a very lousy career in the rabbinate, you know, um, because the Sephardim and the rabbi they, they don't, don't treat their rabbi with respect. And... Uh, um, but nevertheless, he was very important. Uh, you know, he had Shalos and Chubas and all that sort of thing, all of Yaakov. And he, from day one, said that this whole thing is phony. L let me say this. Here's a Sephardic rabbi. You probably wouldn't figure this out. Rabbi Yaakov says, Port is a Moroccan Jew. And, um, and grew up in, in Morocco, was a big uh, place of um, Torah education. Let's put it that way. Did a whole galaxy of famous. Uh, big scholars, I mean, big Talmudic Chachamim, in Nigla and Nister, but especially in, in Gemara and Halacha. And uh, this person over here, uh, Sasportis, is, 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 is a uh, Portuguese name. I mean, six, six doors. So he's come from Portugal. So it's from a Portuguese family that ran away in 1492 and ended up in Morocco. And um, he's a very educated person. And he is a, I'm, I'm going to show you what I mean. He is appointed in 1659, not long before this, by the Emperor of Morocco to be the Moroccan ambassador to Spain. So can you imagine that? Uh, many people don't get this wrong. The Inquisition in Spain, 
I've said it a hundred times, but uh, you know, it doesn't sink in somehow. The Inquisition in Spain never had any power legally over a Jewish Jew. They had all the power in the world over the children of conversos or the descendants of conversos. So if anybody in your family had ever converted and they had a record of it, and they had good records, then you were in trouble if you fell into their hands. And it was forbidden to be in Spain and you get burned and all that sort of thing. On the other hand, if you were Jewish Jew and your ancestors had never converted to Christianity, um, they were expelled in 1492. But let's say for argument's sake, a Jew came to Spain anyway. Um, then that, you don't deal with the Inquisition, you deal with the police. And get a lawyer, and it's like breaking immigration regulations. It is what it is. You know, there might be a prison cell, might be a fine, might be something else, maybe to give you a warning. You understand, people, people have it wrong. We read these stories in Perche books or whatever, that you know, two Jews landed in Spain and they were afraid of the Inquisition all the rest of it. If they were Jewish Jews, they weren't from the conversos, uh, they don't have anything to worry about that. They simply have to worry about the Spanish civil authorities. And if somebody's coming in as a diplomat with a diplomatic passport, and he's representing a powerful person like the Emperor of Morocco, which is across the water from Spain, because the area of Gibraltar and on the other side is Tangier, so in other words, they, they, they're facing each other. So he's a diplomat. So it kind of boggles the mind. You have a famous rabbi, and he was a famous rabbi, who was an ambassador for a couple of years at the court in Madrid, who was, uh, you know, like we would say today, where, where, where Yamaka, you know, with Shemr Shabbos and all the rest of it. So life is strange. And the reason I mention that is, it's not just Tom, some rabbi somewhere in a little shtetl somewhere, Ashkenazic or Sephardic. Very distinguished kind of individual. Um, subsequently, ended up in Amsterdam. He, he, would, he, he tried to be rabbi in the Sephardic Portuguese diaspora, which was never fun for a rabbi. So he ended up in London and in Amsterdam and in Hamburg. And he, among other things, uh, kept a record of the whole Sabatian episode, uh, which he wrote up later on and became our main source, or for many years it was the main source for scholars of what happened at that time, because he wrote letters back and forth uh, to all different communities around the world. He was an indefatigable correspondent. He was sort of like the nemesis of Nathan Ogazi, and Nathan Ogazi wrote a thousand letters pro, and he wrote a thousand letters con. But, we and, and here is two books, these are the sources, this, this Safer, it sits in Noble Street, he wrote, but wasn't published until the 50s in Israel by Professor Tishby. Uh, the Kitzer, sits in Noble Street, the uh, abbreviated uh, version of it was around already since the 1700s. Uh, Riyakim uh, uh, published it, part of his anti sabatian uh, tracts. So here's a person, a very important source for the history of that time. And uh, Tzitz has Noble Street, you know, the withering of the flower, you understand it, but it means Shabtai Tzvi. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the point I'm trying to get at is, even he lies. You know, the historians went and they, and they did the painstaking research, and it turns out after it's all over, then he rewrote a lot of letters. You get it? And the reason I'm mentioning it is not to tell tales out of the school, but rather to say that in the summer of 1666, even he was overwhelmed. And he, even he was saying like this, listen, I was opposed to it. If I was wrong, I was wrong, but God should not hold it against me because I meant well. You understand? But this may really be the real thing. Maybe not. Maybe not. But maybe yes. So what I'm trying to say is, if if even the Satma Rebbe was considering Zionism, you know, it must have been a powerful a powerful movement at that time. Now, um, people at that time all over Europe, Jews were acting. What we would say today nuts. They would say today in a uh, ecstasy. Uh, people sold their uh, property for a song. Right? Because after all, what do you need it for? <laughs> Pretty soon, I'm going to need my house in Baltimore. I'm going to have a mansion 10 times as big as Mechavia. It'll be free, too, if Mashiach is here. <laughs> and uh, the electricity is free and the water, too. Better in Baltimore. A festive mood pervades the Jewish world. Again, Gluck of Hamelin, who's the most famous Jewish one. Now, this is not, this is too good of a picture. There was a costume party. And <laughs> some people here are, are from, in the audience are from the old Frankfurt. <laughs> this, this is the birth of Pappenheim. It's at, a, at a costume party in the 1920s, okay? So you dressed up, it's a Jewish costume party. This is the same story from Hirschville. You know You dress up at a Jewish costume party. You're not coming in like Cleopatra <laughs> at an Orthodox costume party. So what are you coming in as? You're coming in as a Glickel of Hamlin, you know, the most famous Jewish diarist, because she wrote this uh, remarkable diary, which everybody should read. It's in English, and all the, it's in all the languages. She wrote it in old German Yiddish, so a person who knows Yiddish today would have trouble uh, fighting through it, 
And it's a very remarkable story of a lady who lost her husband early in life, and she, and she ran the business, and she raised the children, and, you know, all that sort of thing. And she lived right through this period. And one of the things she does, not the only thing, but one of the things she does is write about the Sabatian episode that they all lived through. And she said, I remember, you know, this guy who had a chain of stores just sold his stores for 10 cents, and another guy uh, put all of his goods in uh, barrels and put him on a boat to go down the Rhine on the way to Israel. I mean, people really thought... Mashiach, this is, this is not pathetic, but pathetic. It's pathos. That people really imagine a Mashiach site and how would somebody react to this? this is, to my mind, the, the most interesting part of the whole Shabtashi episode. You know, I know he was a fake and all the rest of it, but, you know, but, but look how the average people and say, they really had a Muna. You understand? And as I say before, a guy had a good business, he was willing to let it, let it, let it, let it totally go. Uh, people own property, they're willing to let it totally go. Because you want to liquidate your assets, they, they, they take whatever you can to Israel, as you know. Um, in Italy, just to give you an idea, again, I don't know if these names mean anything to you, Ramosha Zakuda, the Ramaz, the, the most famous of the Kabbalists, he's the one who was a student of the student of, of Chaim Vital, if anybody remembers from, from his chain of command. So it was Arizal and Chaim Vital. And Chaim taught down in 1620, and he had among the students Ben Yaman Alevi, he ended up in Italy, and taught this person. So notice, this is a major figure in the Kabbalistic transmission process. And even he in 1666 says, sounds, you know, I don't know, it's not exactly the way we envisioned it, it's not what the reason said, but you know, it could be. Because after all, the Rambam says nobody will know what it's exactly like till it happens. Their vase. And if it is, wow. <laughs> wow. Okay? And so I'm just trying to give you uh, an idea of how sweeping this was in the summer of 1660, because that's when the whole thing happens. In Poland, where all the Ashkenazim live, the largest Jewish community in the world, right? The king of Poland has to issue uh, decrees forbidding the Jews from making parades in the street, carrying out pictures of Shabtai Tzvi. Now, where'd they get pictures of Shabtai Tzvi? From the Christians. The Polish merchants right back descriptions, they make uh, diagrams and, and caricatures and cartoons, I mean, uh, not in a, in, a, in a real way, you know, a portraits, not, not in a mocking way, and uh, the Jews get a hold of them, and then they, it's, <laughs> you know, in the 1600s, Poland at this time, remember from a couple years ago, is not fully recovered from Chmelnitsky. The uh, wars that tore Poland apart and the Jews lasted from 1648 to 1672. So this is right in the middle of it. So the country is in a chaos. Poland is being ravaged by the Cossacks, the Russians, the Swedes, the Prussians, and the Turks, um, none of whom are fun. And uh, in the middle of all this, the Polish Jews, obviously, or many of them, say, like sure, it's the Muslim Mashiach. What's surprising? If Poland is being going through what they, in Polish, they call the potop, the deluge, right, like the mabul. So if they're going through that, yeah, I mean, you know, but we'll read Daniel, read Zechariah, you know, th 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 this is what it's supposed to be like. As long as it culminates in the way that we want it to culminate. And the king of Poland, who's a nice guy, doesn't bother the Jews at all, quite the opposite, but he says like this, you go marching any more of these parades, you're going to have a pogrom on your hands. I can't, I can't control them all. Uh, but that's what it is. Now, in July 20th of 1666, so this is right in the middle of summer, it's Shivasa Thomas. <laughs> okay? Uh, Shabtai, in his throne room, proclaims special liturgies and ritual practices for Shivasa Thomas. And for Tisha B'Av, notice he sends out letters which circulate very quickly. Here's the new order of prayer for Shabbos and, and, and Tisha B'Av. Basically, that year in the Turkish Empire, um, I mean, you won't believe this, Tisha B'Av is celebrated exactly like Simcha's Torah. They take the Torahs out, they dance, they have a party, and if, say, instead of singing songs like Adonai no Bar Yochai, you sing Adonai no Shabtai. <laughs> right? And that's what it is. Because, and I'll tell you again, and people were... But at the height of Simcha, right? Not Hilalus, but Simcha, because this is it. The Mashiach is here. Um, this is the way it's going so far. Now, the denouement, as which you know is coming, comes in the beginning of September. So here was July 20th was Shivasa Batamas. Tisha was what? Early August. Not too different than this, not so different than this year. And, uh, but soon, <laughs> the month of Elul will leave, and we begin the month of Elul, and then the story starts to unravel. The beginning of September, a guy shows up from Poland, named Nechemi Kohen, Nechemi HaKohen. 
um, Shabtai has heard about it on the grapevine. Because I tell you, you know, there's no secrets when Jews get together. And in order to show off, he had already proclaimed to his entourage that he was looking forward to the arrival of this very illustrious Kabbalist who was assigned a positive role in the Messianic era. Right? That's how Shabtai did it. It's sort of like NCSY. Everybody became a vice president of something. You know, that's, that's how the Sabatians were very successful. You came in, like I say, uh, China is taken. How would you like to be the king of Korea? You know, Tasmania, anybody? So, you know, th 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 this is how it worked. Everybody got something. So, this Nechemikon, he's already described as a person, I'm saying this for a reason, a person who's very uh, well known, uh, very knowledgeable, Makubal. He knows all the writings and all that sort of thing. Trouble is, this Nechemi guy was a very, the kind of guy you meet in shul sometimes. He has a pain in the neck, you know? Very, 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 very quarrelsome and uh, always insisting on his way and that sort of thing. So it's gonna, it, it, it was going to be uh, a, a, a storms coming. And indeed, when they meet, uh, Shabtai tries to turn on the charm, and the Chemi will have none of it. And uh, the result is that they start quarreling and arguing. Because Shabtai said, well, what do you think of this operation? And the said, I don't understand. I came here to ask you questions. You claim Mashiach, but in the Zohar it says this and this, and you didn't do that. And in the Gemara it says such and such, and it's supposed to be the opposite of what you're doing. And this place they said this and this and this. For three days they are, three days and nights. They eat a little bit in between, but every, and, and you know, you can't pin anybody down on this sort of thing. Because every time he says, what about this and this, you know, shops like, say, well, it's, it's happening in this and this way. The, the, the passage you're referring to can be interpreted in an alternative manner. And it means this, and both of them were very good at what they did. And so the result is, one moment. They had a very uh, quarrelsome and remarkable account. Um, and it's a very interesting, one of the earliest, not the most reliable, but not the least reliable, uh, account of Shabbat Shalom. He came a few years later from a, in Yiddish, from a guy named Leben Eiser, who was Ashkenazi in Amsterdam, like an Ashkenazi Jew, I think a Polish Jew, who ended up in Amsterdam and uh, was very fascinating, this sort of thing, and wrote a whole account of it. Parts of which are accurate and parts of which are not accurate. And it's a uh, pathetic to read a lot of this, because he's writing in the wake when it's all over, and he says, and I'm reading in the Hebrew translation here, not the uh, Yiddish, the old Yiddish, but he says that, uh, listen, um, people were longing for this to be true. And lay in the Chemikon, and the elder came from Poland, because uh, we Jews, in this bitter Golis that we're in, the 1600s, Right? We're longing to hear good news. If it's not true, it's not true, but we would love it to be true. Bifrap in Medina's Poland, and especially in Poland. Shebog Gedola Harishus, the Yoser, right? That the anti Semitism we call today is extremely severe. I told you, it's in the middle of the trouble years of, of, of when Poland is going through crazy times. Vagolas Akosha, the whole Yom may be Xeris of a bullion. Every day comes new trouble from the Goyim. We Polish Jews, like in the Chemi and the others, are really longing to hear. So he didn't come to be a skeptic exactly, although he was skeptical, but he would like to be that this guy is the real, is the real thing. And he goes on to say that, uh, you know, the Chemi shows up and then he says, How can you claim to be the Mashiach? If he calls every Gabal Shalanu, you're out of order, right? Where's the predecessor, the, uh, the Mashiach ben Yosef? If you remember, we discussed this in the Gaonic uh, description of this. And anyway, it's supposed to be Gogo Magog, or Mecham Rishoni in Naseich Mashiach ben Ephraim. And uh, the Mashiach ben Yosef is supposed to be killed in round one. Or Bepam Hashniya, Yishum Yilochem Bazi Yerg Mashiach ben Ephraim, Bishar Yishulayim. Round, I said it wrong. Round one, the Mashiach, the Jews win. Round two, the Jews lose. And round three, the Jews win. And the Jews are supposed to be kicked out of the cities in which they live and exist in great privation in the outskirts of the cities and in deserts. Again, I actually read this to you in English translation. Uh, Notice, he said, what about that whole big scenario, which is greatly detailed, which you know in Jewish history, I um, mean, in Jewish sources, and obviously, you know, Shabtai Tzvi keeps trying to hit the ball, and this guy won't let him have it. And it turns out, in the end, that what really bothers him, and you're going to laugh at this, what really bothers him is, is how can you be the Mashiach? Actually, I'm the Mashiach. Oh, right? yeah. 
Now, not the Mashiach ben David, but the Mashiach ben Yosef. You understand? And trouble is, Shabtai Tzvi already said a certain person, Mashiach ben Yosef, otherwise I'm sure shooting, he would have said, I guess, you are. <laughs> you know, join the, join the club, you know. You too could be a basketeer, you know. He said, he said, join the club. But he had already said another person was, and so you couldn't do it. And so you had this big clash um, between the two guys, and he won't let go. Like I say, he was a nunnik. So for three days and so forth, they're arguing, and he keeps pointing out that you're lying. He even goes on in a whole, um, according to this, a whole peroration at the end, and he goes on to say, excuse me, that he says, you claim the Mashiach and save Israel. Better to do Shemayin Golas and a fool like you shouldn't get all killed. Because what you're involved in is not going to end well. And what he meant, of course, was you're going to take off the Turks and the rest of the guys around the world and it'll wipe us out. It's not a game you're playing over here. You're an Oichi Yisrael, meaning you're an enemy of the Jewish people, and you're trying to get them all killed by the sword. You're nothing. It's going, this is all going to end up bad. Well, I mean, you don't get pretty, uh, <laughs> like I told you before, this is a pretty blunt uh, set of conversations. Now, um, as he's doing this, so the Shabtai people get really angry, especially his team. Shabtai was the type of guy that always control himself, at least the way he's re uh, recorded in the thing. But his team wasn't. And uh, we saw last week, he paid attention, they were going to kill the, the rabbis in, in Izmir and all that. You know, things get out of hand. This guy sees now, he's alone in the cell with these whole Shabtai team. They're going to kill him. Right. So he rushes to the gate, the door, like in a movie. And he bangs on there to the Turkish jailer and he says, I want to convert to Islam. Because that gives them, uh, that, then they can't kill him. Then they can't kill him. And as soon as the guard hears that, of course, they take him out, and they convert him one, two, three. Right? Uh, wait a minute. And uh, he immediately says, take me to the head Turk, to the prime minister. And they do. And he says, you better watch out, this guy Shabta is a threat. He's a nut, and, uh, but he's dangerous. Uh, so... If you're a Sabatian, you say, yes, this is Judas Iscariot. <laughs> you understand? That, that's, that's how they portray it in their literature. But nevertheless, um, it happens. Uh, Shabtai is then uh, summoned out of the jail, one, two, three, to where the Sultan is staying in Adrianople, in Adirne. Here's, uh, here's Gallipoli, where the jail was. Right up here, this is the modern map of Turkey, that's Adrianople. So it was a favorite hangout. So the, half the time the sultans hung around Istanbul, and half the time over here in Adrianople because of the weather. And a uh, very famous Ottoman uh, center. And so the bottom line is he gets hauled in front of the um, Turkish authorities. And now he's in real trouble. And they have a session. It's not a trial. because In Turkey, they don't have a trial. But it's, it's an interrogation. Here we have pictures of what the divan always used to look like, which is exactly how it was. So he gets hauled in front of here, and the cabinet is, is sitting there uh, judging him, so to speak. And are you a political threat or not? And the sultan, at that time, is uh, watching through the lattice work, because that's how they used to do it in those days. You can go there today and see it. I have no intention of leading a Jewish history Turk to Turkey right now, the heck with them. But nevertheless, <laughs> this, is how, uh, this is how it goes. And this is, the, this is Kaprulu, the grand vizier. So you can just imagine, they take the Shabtai, who, by the way, is a real Jew. He can't speak Turkish. He's born in the country. He don't talk Yiddish, or in this case, Ladino and so forth. Spanish he knew from, uh, you know, from, from the home, <laughs> as it were. The, even 100 years later, they still kept up the Spanish. But Turkish, very poorly. Um, the story gets even uh, crazier. Um, they say, uh, who are you? He says, uh, I don't know what this is all about. Aren't you the guy who claims to be the Jewish Messiah? I don't know what you're talking about. So he had no intention of going down like a hero. Um, the Turks are talking among each other. Present at the divan is the Sultan's physician. The Sultan's physician is this guy Mustafa Hayatizad, which means Mustafa Schneerson, the, the son of Taylor. And uh, he's a, uh, a convert to Islam. His actual name is, he, he's in a barbano. Okay? It's a crazy story. 
he was a Jewish physician of the Sultan. Uh, this particular Sultan, Muhammad IV, became Sultan at the age of like four. And uh, so he was always in delicate health. Uh, the mother, the Validi Sultan, you know, the, 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 the Queen Mother, she has all the power. Uh, she is a very, uh, I don't know what the right word is, bigoted uh, Muslim. And she said like this, the hands of an unbeliever is feeling the pulse of my son, you know, that, that, that can't be. The, the tray for hands. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he has to uh, convert or he loses his job. And, and if you lose his job, you lose your head. So to make a long story short, he converted. And you won't believe this. This family became big, they, they became hereditary doctors for the sultans until the 1750s, so close to a century. And one or two, you, you really won't believe this, one or two of them became the leading post, post game in the Sheikh al-Islam, they came the leading poskim in Sunni Islam because they don't have a priesthood, they have like Rosh Hashivas, you know what I mean, like poskim. So it's, it boggles the mind that the Abarbanel's great-grandson or something like that was the top individual <laughs> in the Islamic uh, legal uh, world. But uh, this goes to show you. So my point is, he happens to be at the same there, and basically he tells Shabtai, if you take my advice, you'll do what I did. Understand? If you take my advice, you'll do what I did you don't want to consider the alternatives, <laughs> right? And uh, now there are many legends that go along this. They say the Sultan said he'd shoot him. I mean, there are many versions of the story. It's hard to, you know, the, the Jewish imagination ran wild. But this, as best as we can tell, is what happened. And, um, and he did. He agrees. Shabtai agrees. And yeah, he converts. He changes his clothes because the Jews were one color and the Muslims another. He's given a Muslim wife because in Islam, if you convert, you have to get a, another spouse. She's going to watch that you don't cheat. Isn't that interesting? They're very, very smart. No, 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 but it's very, that you're not going to really be Jewish. No, that's what I mean. It's, it's very smart that you're given a spouse, right? Uh, it's very primitive, but very clever. So in, in Islam, whenever they used to convert, a Jew or a Christian would convert, had to take a Muslim spouse. And then, yeah, he still had his other wife. And um, he gave him a new name. Now he's Aziz Mehmed Effendi. And they give him a job in the Social Security Administration, as we would call it today. <laughs> he becomes, becomes a Kapichibashi, which is another way of uh, Kapichibashi, which is another way of saying the head doorman. What do you call that? Have you ever heard of the uh, city, uh, uh, city Hall of Baltimore, Maryland? <laughs> How many people have, have jobs with pensions because they open and close the door for the mayor? <laughs> They pushed, when I was young, they used to have, maybe it's not anymore, but when I was young, in Delisandro's time, the old man, <laughs> there was a guy who got money, this was, a, this was a job. One guy money to push the elevator going up, another guy money to push the elevator going down. If anybody's off to remember that sort of thing. So, the whole world's the same. And uh, so he gave him a job in the SSA. And uh, this way, they figured to get more mileage out of it, the Turks obviously, than if they would have killed him and made him martyr. Because here, lots of Jews, they hope, will be inspired. The person that they put all their religious beliefs in recognize Islam, so then they will. It's not, it's not a dumb cheshman. Excuse me. Now the Muslims gloat. Shabtai is 40 years old, is dejected. And the Jews are shocked. Okay? How did the Jews, let's go to the next one. How did the Jews feel, right, that they put all their time and money and effort into this? proposal, and then it kind of exploded in their faces. Um, after all, this really calls Judaism into serious question. Why did the Jews reject Jesus or Muhammad? So, oh, the rabbis, they can tell the real thing from the not real thing. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? This fool you believed in? He did nothing? You know, if you told me he was a, he, a Bar Kokhba type, all right, well, he was nothing. And, you, you, and he converted the, the drop of a hat. And this is what you put all your amuna into? It, it, by the way, it is embarrassing. Um, what is indeed the shot? Has Shabtai been a faker all the time? He doesn't seem to have thought so, not if we study as I've tried to lay it out for you. Kind of believed in himself. And if he wasn't a faker, then why would he convert? Why didn't he go down to the hero? There's no way for anybody to answer this because you're dealing with the psychology of a person that's gone for hundreds of years. You can just guess. But the questions are very powerful. And if you were living at that time, the confusion that will reign throughout the Jewish world it must have been extraordinary from one end of the Jewish world to the other. All I know is the Jews around the world look incredibly stupid. No question about that. 
And here they're always saying, I'm Chacham Ben Jews are so smart, all the rest of it. Really? Like I said before, you put your money and you sold your business for what? For, 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 now really, you could look at it like this. They were so interested in, in the gula that they were willing to drop everything. I understand that. But you understand what I'm saying also, he said, but, but you're credulous. Basically, this is what the Rajva warned about in the 13th century. Okay? He said, don't put your trust easily to anybody. The Jewish people, as the Rajva said, didn't even put their trust in Moshe Rabbeinu. And, the, and, and that was a plus. So, don't, well, how do you put your trust in, 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 in some dude over here? But nevertheless, that's what happened. Shabtai himself rallies and starts to really shoot the bull. Because he doesn't say, That would have been heroic too. Here's how the movie should end. He throws himself off the cliff and leaves a note behind. Right? But he didn't do that. He starts to really shoot the bull. He starts to say like this, I did it, but you have to understand, it's all part of the prophetically predicted messianic process. Get it? Now, if you really understand the Zohar properly, if you understand the Gemara and Ksuvis and this Medrash over here and that thing over here, there is a time and a, there, there's a reason that the Mashiach will find himself in a situation where he has to temporarily apostatize in pursuit of the higher goal to bring Geula to the world, especially for Klai Yisrael. In other words, I really still am Jewish. Okay? Um, that's the way he does it. Nathan of Gaza, as if by intuition, has the same idea. And so they both start publishing and sending out letters to this effect. So basically, chazak ve'amatz. Don't be uh, overturned by, uh, you know, the evidence of your eyes. Who are you going to believe, your eyes? Or, you know, or, or, or the or proper and correct interpretation of the facts. <clears throat> well, um, this really begins a process of the telling of lies that is to cover other lies. And this is the origin of what we refer to in history as Sabatianism. Until now, I've talked about Shabtai Tzvi and his ups and downs. But now we begin the origin of something that will last a long time after Shabtai Tzvi, 150 years, and arguably after, longer. And uh, they call it Sabatianism, it's not the same thing. And it's an alternative form of Jewish theology. You know what I said? Shabtai and Nasan and others will now begin for the first time in Jewish history, basically, or since the Second Temple period, to offer completely different categories of Jewish theological uh, thought. Once you interpret, however ingeniously, the Torah, the Talmud, and the Zohar, the Arizal, to include a Messiah who apostatizes, you're in a parallel theological universe. Okay? Now, what was the reaction of Klal Yisrael? That's what they would say if this was a from speech. But who knows? There is no Klal Yisrael. The Jews didn't have a church, meaning they didn't get together all the rabbis in a convention to decide what's the approach to Judaism. Such a thing didn't exist in the 17th century. Instead, what you have is a set of organic and spontaneous reactions which historians can identify. In other words, what did this person here do in Italy? And what did that person do in Germany? And one in England and Yemen and Persia and places like that? And broadly speaking, the Jews fell into several categories. The normal ones, they say, I guess, what a bummer, what dummies we were, let's not talk about this and let's move forward. That, my friends, is the only normal way to deal with it. If you made a terrible mistake and all the rest of you just acknowledge the mistake, it's very embarrassing and you don't have to talk about it anymore. We all know you did it and, and let's move on. Okay? And that's really what happens. Um, the normal ones proceed to weed out the Pinkase Akihila. In other words, wherever they go, they go to the town and they rewrite the records. They tear out the pages to make them look stupid. All the things, they're pro sabatian That's why we have trouble finding the whole, you know, because they want to rewrite history. They're very, they're very open and clear about it, right? Uh, so here you are in, in 1666, and you're already holding by Mark Shapiro. You understand? Because um, how the Orthodox rewrite history. They absolutely want to write history. Why, why do we want to record all the terrible and stupid mistakes we made? They didn't have a modern historicist sensibility where you want to have record every time you blew your nose, you know? He said, what do you have to know all that for? It was, it, 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 it was an embarrassing episode. Let's move on. I would even go farther. They held like Rabbi Schwab. Read this. Right, take the trouble. Uh, Schwab once said, you know, we're, we're, history is a negative, I mean, certain types of history, a negative thing because what ethical purpose is served by preserving a realistic historical picture? Nothing but the satisf satisfaction of curiosity, okay? And read the rest of it, okay? 
Uh, this is a, a, a polemic against a modern historicist sensibility. He's in principle opposed to what we call modern history. Why do I have to know the bad things that you did? Right? What good does that do to the Jewish people? Yes, we made a mistake in time of Shabbat Day see That part we know, and it suffices. Okay, should I read it? Nothing but that. We should tell ourselves and our children the good memories of the good people. Their unshakable faith, their staunch defense of tradition, their life of truth, impeccable honesty, the boundless charity, and the greatest reverence for Torah and Torah's ages. And by the way, those are not lies. It's just telling half the picture. They're not lies. Okay? Uh, what is gained by pointing out the inadequacies and contradictions, and so on and so forth? It's, it's actually a very interesting quote. Now, uh, that's exactly what the quote unquote normal people did at that time. They said, you know, anybody has a diary, burn it. Anybody has a. Uh, records in the official records of the Kehillah, toss it, get rid of it. I'm just trying to, this, this is how life went. Um, if you wanted to be cynical, you could do, you could say that they held like Winston Churchill, right? Who, of course, always advocates truth being accompanied by a bodyguard of lies. Now, um, others, that was the normal people. Others were too invested. They put a lot of their emotional and other capital into Shabbat Day 3. They said, this cannot be true. There's, it can't be so much that we believed in and daven for and, you know, everything we cannot, it can't be true. So it isn't true. <laughs> he really didn't convert. It's all baloney. Or it was a ghost who converted, I promise you. Or it was Shabbat, but it's all part of a prophetic plan. And the conversion is the Sar La Zazel. Anybody remember the Ramban and all that where, you know, sometimes you have to make certain Carbonus to the Sitra Achra, you know, in certain ways. This is all part of it, you understand? Really, he's a high priest on Yom Kippur working on behalf of the, uh, of the Jewish people. You can go with that line also. Nathan of Gaza, sticking to his general line, Sabathian lines, says what? Let's go to the next one. He says, it's the final descent, how should I put it, into the goat dung to liberate the last apple, okay? Meaning, there were last little bits of Kedusha out there covered by deep evil, in order for the Mashiach to liberate them, because that's necessary to save all the sparks, all the last apples and reattach them to the tree. It's even necessary to, to, to uh, convert to another religion for the purpose of extracting the good out of there and bringing the Geula. Once the whole process is over, this will seem like an insignificant event. The hotbed for the Sabatian believers in all this baloney was and was for the next hundred years and more this area, the Balkans. The Sephardic Jews in Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, what we call today Serbia, Yugoslavia, Romania, these areas uh, were, I, would, I, I mean, we estimate today a clear rove of the people were Sabathians for 100 years at least. That's quite, that's interesting, right? Um, that doesn't mean everybody was 100% Sabathian, but everybody was at least 50% or 75%. And that's why uh, in Poland and all this, they always had trouble because it's right next door, here's Poland. So I was afraid of seeping in these bad influences from across the frontier, which did happen. Uh, that's something for next time. But uh, the Sephardic, now the Sephardic rabbis, were the, the regular ones, some of them also were secret communists, you know. But the ones that weren't, uh, their attitude was like this. Let's ride this storm out. Let's try to, uh, uh, have, what's the right word? To deal with the public where they are and try little by little to wean them away uh, from this uh, disbelief, but don't push it too hard because it'll, it'll blow up in your face. It'll be counterproductive. Uh, so it was a very weird time in the post uh, Shabtai year period. There are many who, tick, who are ticked off if Shabtai is criticized throughout the Balkans. And so the Turkish rabbis put out the following policy Don't talk about him, good or bad. Let's just leave the subject of Shabtai. No, since this is so productive of fights in Shoal, We'd like to have Shal show us. Thank you very much. We'd like to have in Mincha. Don't, as soon as you mention, right? As soon as you mention Shal Tai Tzvi, you, 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 you just disrupted Shachris. You understand? You just disrupted Rosh Hashanah. It, it doesn't work. Because he'll say, yeah, and he'll say, no. And you cannot get any kind of consensus on this. And there are too many people on both sides. You understand? Like half the show is one way, and half the show is the other way, or, or sometimes worse than that. And so, Let's just talk about the weather. You know what I'm Let's talk about the war with Crete. Let's talk about something else, which, which is a very interesting kind of a, a approach. So it, it left the Jewish world in a very weird uh, situation. The problem is, of course, that the Shabtai, or Aziz 
Mehmed Effendi, uh, lives in Adrianople and in Istanbul. Remember, he's a guy now. He's a Muslim. He can go wherever he wants. <laughs> you forget it. He's not in jail anymore. He's out there. And as a Gentile, he can do whatever he wishes. He has a personal following of a couple hundred families who converted the time he did because some of his followers were such believers that if he went into Islam, they did too. So now you have a whole chevra, I mean a large chevra, that goes from town to town. And it's a scene because you can't touch them. They're goyim. But they go to shul and they will start singing their Zemiras and their Shabbos thing and their Rosh Hashanah thing. And the drive everybody else crazy. And they say, are you a Muslim? He said, they wink, yeah, yeah, I'm a Muslim. Yeah, but, but this is all part of the Messianic process. And there are many Jews who envy them. Sometimes they do Muslim religious things. Sometimes they do Jewish religious things. Shabtai is really bullying both of them over. He tells the Muslims, I'm working to convert the Jews. He tells the Jews, wink, wink, I'm you know, working to the Muslims. And no, no, no. He sends out a whole stream of secret messages to groups of followers. I personally think the Turks knew about this because they were the opposite of dumb. But they figure everything I'm talking about disintegrates Judaism, so it's good. Keep the ball, you know, keep the ball rolling, keep the pot boiling if you prefer. So the aftermath of the conversion of Shabbat was not the end of the story at all. Um, this is what's going on over here. Now he really starts to develop a cult. Meaning now, in this last decade of his life, because he lives in 16, died in 1676. So well, 10 years later, he's gone at the age of 50. In his 40s, the last year of his life, all this stuff, something majorly snapped in him. Um, or maybe success spoiled Rock Hunter. It's, it's hard to tell. But now he changes a different person. They bring him money. They bring him girls. He throws parties, wild gatherings. He still suffers from bipolar things. But now his mania starts to be expressed more sexually, which wasn't the case until then, if you've been following the story. Um, and this is going to be a, 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 a key feature of Sabatius next century. Theologically, he comes up with his own trinity, right? He, now he wasn't a great thinker in Mechadish, but he put out a few lines and his followers developed into a theology. Basically, God consists of three parts. The Malka Kadisha, the Shechina, and the Atika Kadisha. I actually have it in, in reverse order. Trinity, thank you very much. <laughs> that, that's interesting. And this represents this aspect of God, that represents that aspect of God. All I can tell you is that when this stuff gets out there and flourished among many, for 150 years, this person is rolling over in the grave. <laughs> he said, what happened over here? Okay, what, have you ever heard of Shema Yisrael? Whoa, 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 what happened? Moreover, uh, because it is, anything suggesting the division of the Godhead into different parts becomes, at least among certain famous Gedolim, uh, super trafe. The Nodeh Behuda will become famous for something like this. You want to say the same yichud? What does it say? When a person recites a bracha, it's in order to be miach, to bring together. Kutcha brichu, that's one part of God. Ushchinte plus the shchina, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Get out of here. Right? That, I don't want to hear that anymore. And it's famous. He forbid people to say it. Somebody, somebody went to him and said, can I use your asterisk? He says, yes. And uh, as soon as the guy said, the yichud, he said, give my asterisk back. Get out of here. He said, no, I don't mean it this way. Get out of here. I don't want to hear any of this kind of stuff. He's a very famous responsum where he bans and attacks the reciting of the shame Yichud because they see it as, as traces of Sabatianism. The, you know, there's God, period. What are you, a, a super theologian, a philosopher? If you show me your Rizal card and then I'll talk to you. you know? If you're a regular person, you're actually performing, po uh, what's the word, uh, polytheism. You get it? Because you're believing in different gods, even though you're too stupid to realize it. And uh, this, becomes, no, no, this becomes the attitude of many of the, what I would call the uh, mainline Rabbonim. You follow? In the 18th century, which is get out of here. Just stick with the Rambam. You, know? you don't have to get into those kind of stuff because if you do, you, you won't realize it. You get entrapped and ensnared in your own thing. So it poisons Jewish life. Poisons Jewish life in the theological level, in the ideological level. This is what it was. To top off the weirdness, a year after he converts, Shabtai Tzvi and his wife have a baby boy. <laughs> you figure that out. Like I say, I saved that for the movie. The wife, the, the one we talked about last week, the poor girl from Livorno, from Leghorn. Jewish. Right, yeah, the Jewish one. That's right, that's right, not from the Muslim wife. Okay, with Miss Leghorn. And the baby is named Yishmael Mordechai. <laughs> I mean, come on, all right? Now, have a, uh, let's put it this way. 
you know, at the bris, the guy stands up and says, we named the baby Shmuel because, you know, after whatever, who knows. Anyhow, um, Shabtai, and, 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 and then it gets better. Nathan of Gaza shows up. He makes a visit because he wants to see what's happening there. He shows up in the Balkans, and he, and he and, and Shabtai, the reuniting of the Beatles, you know, they take it on the road. They take it on the road. They go to Salonika, to Adrianople, to Constantinople, to all kind of Jewish communities. They visit synagogues. They do zany rituals. It's unreal. It's surreal. Because they're not Jewish. So they can do whatever they want. Well, Nathan is not Jewish, but I said it wrong. Nathan is Jewish, but Shabtai is not Jewish, officially. Shabtai is not a Muslim. And so he can go wherever he wants. And obviously the Turkish authorities are not bothering him by doing zany things. And so here you are. I mean, it sounds funny, but it's not funny. Let's put it this way. I would not like to be a rabbi in a shul or a community, and all of a sudden, this shows up. It's not like the Gary Rebbe showing up. You know, you're talking about something else over here, right? They show up and they take over the town for Shabbos, and who knows what they're going to do Friday night, and then, you know, the, 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 the Shabbos rituals and the kashras and the davening. And the, the guys are nuts, right? You got Nathan of Gaza and something. I mean, like I say, it's, 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 I don't know, I don't follow the Grateful Dead or something like that. It's, 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 it's like nuts. You see? And nobody can stop them. And so finally, the leading rabbis in Turkey, they go to the Turkish government. And they say like this, listen, um, what are you doing? As long as he has contact with Jews, it's going to be bad for both sides. Banish him to an all-Gentile area for both of our sakes. So basically, they adopt the policy of Ferdinand and Isabella. Because why did Ferdinand and Isabella kick the Jews out 14 What's the official reason and the real reason? He says, as long as the Jews and these people who are half Jews, not Jews, each one's going to have as a, as a bad influence on the other. Okay? I mean, you don't really want disabatheism to contaminate and affect I Islam, do you? And we don't want to affect Judaism. You're the bosses over here, fine. And we're the third class citizen, fine. But at least everybody knows where they fit. Do you really want to do this? As a result, Shabtai is arrested in Shul on Shabbos in Constantinople in the middle of one of his Karl Bach davenings in, in a Shul. That, that's what happened, you know, he, because, no, you don't, I, I don't have the time to go through all the details. I could just sit here and titillate everybody. He comes in with a banjo in the middle of a Saturday morning and he starts singing Spanish love songs because he says, when it says, I'm in love with you, Melisan, Melisan really refers to that, Tika Kadisha, right? <laughs> you know, and all this business. So, uh, and where's the choir? And where are all the other things like that? And so the result is that um, they banish him in 1672. So he's, what, 46 years old? And uh, they send him to Montenegro, <laughs> to Oquin, which is the famous pirate and slave center. And here's the Ottoman Empire. He was here, they sent him here. <laughs> Okay, as far as the way you can get. This is an area, no Jews. It's a pirate uh, capital. It's a big slave, a black slave capital. It's in a slave market. You know, they used to sell the African slaves to the Ottoman Empire through here and so forth, if you care about that. And uh, no Jews. And uh, he'll be safe there, isolated from the other Jews. Here, he maintains his ties with the believers, but it's a lot more difficult. Moreover, being like Napoleon in St. Helena, he gets involved in sordid affairs with his followers. You know, he marries, he marries a girl who's already married someone else. That's a, you know, one of those things. Uh, and then she has a baby from the first husband and so forth, which shocks some of the followers. Of course, the other followers say, no, it's all part of the messianic process. You follow? Yeah, uh, yeah right. So there's a final paradox to the story. Um, in 1676, three and a half, four years after he shows up in this town, um, he gathers together, he, 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 he uh, orders from uh, the closest Jewish place in Albania, uh, a sitter and a machzer. Um, he doesn't have a minion, but he has a few people together with him in his house. And he drops dead in Yom Kippur during the Elah. Okay? As a matter of fact, it, it, it gets even better than that because uh, <laughs> if you notice this Friday, we just did this in the poetry class, if, anyone, if anybody's here from that. Uh, I mean, this is the opening from Moshe Ben Ezra, the famous poem. This is the opening. Sure, you know, yeah, this is the most famous Sephardic uh, synagogue music. And, uh, and he's a Sephardic Jew. And so he said, Bishas Anilo, kills over. Of course, you know what his followers are going to say. Uh, but anyhow, um, this, is, this is weird. He's very, he, of course, the Turks take him and bury him in a Muslim cemetery. There is no Jewish cemetery where he lives. So that was the end 
of Shabtai Tzvi. Well, was it the end of Shabtai Tzvi? Nathan of Gaza is going to try to keep the cause going, but he drops dead four years later at a young age. Shabtai died in 1676, Nathan died in 1680, skipping over all the details. So what now? What now? You'd figure that people say like this, look, we, we were true believers, we held the line, but he died. You know, we, we have to pinch ourselves and, and, and admit we were wrong also. Not true. The Ma'aminim refused to believe they were wrong. Shabtai has a son. <laughs> he has a son. The way I heard about it is, his soul was transmigrated into the son, as a Gilgal. But the son soon dies, a few years later, at a young age. So what happens then? The problem they have over the next years is, where's Shabtai? You understand? <laughs> and he will, he will, there will be many sightings of him. I know it sounds funny. There are many sightings of him for the next 40 years, until it gets like ridiculous, you know. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing, but no, if you want a good parallel, when I was a kid, many years ago, they used to have in the National Enquirer, I think it's Hitler's still alive, you know, in, in some place. I, what do you want to say, in the year 2015, Hitler's still alive, you know? It's, it's, it's too late. So that's what happened eventually, he shot see. But for years and years and years, he was seen here, he was cited there. By the way, Reb Leib ben Ezer, who the Yiddish Chronicle, he says, nobody knows what happened to him. He's been cited in many places and things like this. This, this, this is how it, it all ended up. Um, the belief among the believers was he's coming in 40 years. That'd be 1706. There was a big buildup in Hungary and Poland towards the year 1706. Why? Right? For Friday night? For 40 years, I rejected the generation, and they are a wayward people, and they do not, my, do not know my ways. They refuse to follow Shabtai Tzvi. But now, wait a minute. Moses, according to the Medrash, was hidden in Pharaoh's household for 40 years. Oh, till he came forth and vayar, uh, I told you, I could do it too if you paid me. You know what I'm saying? And so this belief was there. Problem is, 1706 came and went. This is, this is the ultimate, you know, uh, exploding of the theory, popping in a bubble. Because every single theory came to be empirically verified. And so you see, you see the dead hand of the Rajma <laughs> saying, where's that empirical verification? Uh, Laban Oyser, and with this I'll conclude my remarks for tonight, uh, to try to put a little bit of a better spin on this. A very, um, it's an amusing but very upsetting episode in Jewish history, as you can imagine. He's writing this a few years in the 1690s or something like that, and he says, that, uh, of course, he records all the terrible things that happened. And he says, the biggest nace in the whole business was the Turks did not punish the Jews. He regards this as an unbelievable nace. The Sultan of Turkey, if I wanted to, I could put Turkish atrocity pictures on there from woodcuts of the 14, 15, 16, 1700s. They play hardball. They know how to torture like nobody tortures. They could do things with the parts of the body. They go, forget it. And the ISIS is, 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 is reviving all that today. And they didn't touch a single Jew. The Jews themselves regarded this as a nice nigla, right? Uh, I would remind you, in Poland at this time, the Jews went through Chmelnitsky, and then after, in the aftermath, the Cossacks, the, 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 the Swedes, and the, 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 oh, the Tatars, they went through a lot of killings and deaths. In the Ottoman Empire, no Jews were killed, even though the guy said he was going to depose the Emperor of Turkey and take over. Why was this? How do you account for this miracle? What did we Jews that were as good? It should be that God should have been angry at us and should have punished us for following a false messiah by bringing a terrible calamity. This is what he's writing in 1690s. And, and, and what he says, is, this, is, this is a good uh, sermon for the nine days. He says, in his opinion, the reason it didn't happen was because Lamaisa, all the Jews made up with each other, forgave each other. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, whatever the reason was, everybody stopped fighting, everybody stopped quarreling. People really buried the hatchet. You understand? Because they thought it was a Mashiach site. And so he figured like this. There's a very famous teaching in the Chazal that says, Chabor Ephraim Atzabim Hanachla, which, can be, which is a very difficult passage to translate. There's no good translation of it. But I can tell you what the sages say in the Talmud and the Medrash. And they say is this. Chabor Ephraim, as long as Ephraim, the Jewish people are, Chabor, are, are united, even if they follow Atzabim, even if they follow idols, God says, I guess, Hanachla, leave them alone. Because 
if they have shalom and achdus among themselves, it's a famous teaching. They say in the time of Achav, there were fewer casualties than the time of King David, because it is. Right? Because they didn't have the quarrels and Lashon Har and all the rest of it, even though the time of Achav was notorious for idol worship, and the time of King David was the reverse. Okay? And so he sees over here, the, um, he says, because we were good in being Adam Lachavero, so God caused a weird thing that the Turks didn't harm anybody. It's, it's not a bad theory. I mean, it's a way to test it, but it's, it's a nice uh, thought to end with on the nine days. So Beitianism was not dead, but that will have to attack next time. Good night. Yes.